Hi guys, and welcome back for another comprehensive guide to Dota Underlords. So my previous guide covered the level build, the Brute Poison guide that many of you have enjoyed. And thank you so much for all the feedback on that guide. I will do my best to put some of it into practice here. Today, I originally meant to publish a guide on knights. And in my opinion, and I strongly believe the uh, the only legitimate way to play knights is to play roll knights. Now, we spoke about level builds versus roll builds. Level builds where you're investing all of your gold into leveling up and reaching levels 8, 9, 10 and hitting that good stuff, tier 4, tier 5 stuff at the end. Um, and essentially uh, ignoring three stars altogether. Roll builds, unsurprisingly, are the opposite. So we're focusing on three-star pieces and essentially ignoring the fact that levels 9 and 10 exist uh, during the game, pretty much. And um, so I started with, you know, how to play knights. And the, um, the first thing that we need to do is to figure out how to play roll builds in general. So I began an introduction and I started making my show notes for that guide. And it ended up being more than 2,000 words. <laughs> and so this guide was born. Uh, a guide to simply how to play roll builds, the mechanics behind rolling, behind the shop, how to manipulate the shop in your favor, and how to sort of um, position yourself in the best way to take advantage of what the shop offers. And then we'll be able to basically link back to this guide as an introduction to each of the following guides on roll builds. So knights will be coming, of course. I'm not going to go into specifics here, but there will be a separate knights guide that will capitalize on the things that we discuss now. And additionally, I will also cover brawnies, mages, and assassins. So those are the four roll builds that I use um, with enough confidence to publish a guide on them. I may do others in the future, but generally speaking, I focus on what I consider to be meta builds and uh, ones that simply gain MMR. That's that's the ones that I like. So, yeah, that's what we're going to be looking at, and I hope it's useful for you guys. So let's get started. Why should we play role builds then? There are a few reasons to play roll builds. First of all, if you really just enjoy that three-star process of, of going through the shop, trying to find those uh, extra two stars, building up the three stars, uh, and then having those singular powerful pieces on board. Advantages of having really powerful pieces rather than lots of uh, alliance bonuses or whatever um, is that, uh, or one of the advantages, is that you can have very, very good item synergy. So if you end up with... A a very strong item and then you put it onto a weak or medium piece uh, you don't get the full potential from it whereas if you've got a very strong three star piece and then you get a very strong you know damage carry item a butterfly for example or whatever then suddenly you put it on a three star luna instead of a two star bat rider it's a huge huge difference in terms of output so it, it's exponential and that is uh, very satisfying and uh, definitely uh, a fun play style if you can make it work. Additionally, it's to take advantage of when the shop offers you a particular set of units. So if you just happen to see plenty of brawny, plenty of knights, plenty of mages in the early game, you want to have these roll builds in your repertoire so that you are able to take advantage. Yes, of course, you could simply ignore those pieces and continue playing your level build, level hunters, level brute poison, level mages, whatever you're planning to uh, to play as your reliable level build. And I don't fault you for it, but um, you may be missing out on some MMR if the if the shop offers you lemons, then you know make lemonade. You've you've got the knights, use them. You've got the brawnies, use them. Um, they are very powerful builds if the shop offers them to you. Disclaimer, if the shop does not offer them to you and you just think, I want to play some three-star knights today, that will go very badly for you. <laughs> Almost always. I have uh, play, I've tried to force various role builds, and I'm sure many of you have as well. In my case, it was in order to do research for my guides. So I'm preparing various guides. And so I wanted to get footage and experience playing those guides. And so I was forcing them. I was forcing Brute Poison a lot before that guide. And it was pretty good 
fairly reliable, you can get into it most of the time. With roll builds, that's less the case. So you end up trying to force your way into a roll build. You will end up either contested, we'll talk about that in a minute, or you will end up just missing, not hitting enough of those pieces, you don't get enough momentum, and three-star roll builds do rely on tempo, momentum, pressure, and hitting your rolls. Uh, now, some of that, of course, is Lady Luck, and we'll talk about all the ways that we can try to beat her in just a moment. First, we need to understand the shop odds and the chances of particular tier heroes being offered to you. Um, there are several ways to manipulate the shop, but we're going to start off with the most basic and the easiest to get your head around, which is depending on the tier of heroes that you wish to roll down for, the ones that you intend to three star first, then you need to work out which level you want to be in order to have the highest chances of hitting those heroes. Rules of thumb, which apply and are very useful, are that if you are trying to hit tier 1 heroes, then you want to be rolling on levels 3 and 4. You don't really want to be going too much higher than that, otherwise your chances of hitting 1 star, uh, sorry, 1 cost heroes in the shop uh, decreases rather quickly. If you are looking to hit tier 2, 2 cost heroes, then you want to be rolling at five or six. It depends on what your priority is. If you just need to hit tier two heroes, then rolling on five is better. If you need more strength on board and you don't mind finding some three cost tier three heroes uh, as well, then uh, level six is better. But both of them viable for finding uh, tier two heroes. And if you are looking for tier 3, 3 costs, then you are rolling on level 7. Uh, it's the best percentage chance you have to find tier 3 uh, heroes. And it's important to know these by heart. And it's important to know in advance the progression of each of your role builds. And that's where my future guides on those will come in handy. If they are completed, I will come back to this guide and link them down below. Once you've gone past level 7, uh, you are really into tier 4, tier 5 heroes, and it's no longer a roll build. Roll builds don't roll down for 3 star tier 4s. It doesn't exist. And one of the reasons it doesn't exist is there are no special 3 star abilities for tier 4 heroes. So some of those 3 star abilities that you get only when a hero hits three stars are some of the reasons why roll builds are so incredibly powerful. They can lead to very uh, impressive synergies and they are exponentially better than simply the stat increases that you get for reaching three star. If you don't know, the stat increases are essentially only double what you are at two stars. So if your health is 1600 at two star, it's probably 3200 did I get that? 1,600, 3,200, yep, yeah, good, basic maths. Uh, 3,200 at three star, approximately. It doesn't. It's not the same for every hero, but essentially you are buying nine copies of the hero, three to get your two star, and a further six to get your three star, but you only double the stats. So gold to stats wise, you can see that level builds have a little advantage in terms of just adding more stats to the board while paying a bit less. However, they don't have access to these three-star abilities, which are, as I said, insanely powerful very often. Obviously not all of them, but the ones that we're gonna focus on are. So if there is a three-star ability, which is key to your strategy working out, then you need to know exactly which hero that is and which tier that is, and therefore which level you need to roll at to find that hero. Examples are Crystal Maiden in Mages because her 20% cooldown reduction for all of your heroes is unbelievably impactful, not to mention the fact that her basic ability getting stronger is, is very impactful as well. So she is a very key um, hero to, uh, to three-star in a mage level build. 
also lich in uh, sorry in a mage role build in a mage role build also lich is very very impactful because at two star he's frankly very underwhelming but at three star he gains chain frost and it's the whole reason to put lich on your board is his three star massive spell damage uh, bouncing uh, nuke ability in assassins bounty hunter also a tier one uh, three star that you absolutely need in order to make assassins work well because he grants one gold per kill and therefore he essentially if he kills one two or three units per uh, round he's almost providing your interest gold on his own he, he single-handedly restores the economy that you have usually destroyed in order to find him and it's a very very powerful uh, ability that you need to make assassins work smoothly in both of those cases you know that therefore you need to find tier one three stars and therefore you need to be rolling on levels three or four now you don't normally reach your full uh, economy potential during level three because you're automatically getting one experience per round and after the four or five rounds you get up to uh, level four automatically. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop it. You can't choose not to level up. So your only real choice is whether you roll down on the round before that happens, um, which will be quite damaging to your economy, but will give you a much, much higher chance of finding tier one heroes. Uh, or if you simply wait till you level up to tier four, get your economy in check and then roll down there where your chances of finding tier ones are still pretty high, uh, just 10% lower than they were a minute ago. Brawnies, however, are not so interested in the tier one hero. The only tier one hero that usually finds its way into a brawny build automatically is Snapfire. And it's not really worth staying low in order to roll for her because the most important pieces in a brawny build are Bristleback and Juggernaut. And so you really do want their three-star abilities. They're incredibly strong and powerful. And so you need to go to level five as quickly as you can. And you might even consider going to level six to increase your chances of finding Beastmaster as well. It's completely up to you. Uh, we'll talk about that during the brawny guide. However, it's good to know that the pieces that you're looking for, not just the ones that you're looking for right now, but you need to think ahead and think, what am I looking for next? What will be, you need to know which level to be at to get, to give you the best chance of uh, hitting it and be aware that you can never go down a level. So once you've leveled up, you can never say, oh, I want to get those level five roll odds back. I'll, I'll just go down. No, it's impossible. Once you've hit a level, that's it. You can only go higher. And the higher you go, the lower chance you will have of finding the lowest tier heroes. So if uh, low tier three star heroes are necessary for your build, you need to stay low for a while until you find them. However, you do also need to adapt. So what is really important in a role build is working out how much value are you getting from each role? In other words, each time you roll down, you'll be offered a fresh shop and you need to think at the level that I'm currently at, how many pieces are reasonably likely to show up that would improve my build, right? That I'm looking for, that I want. So if I know, if I'm playing um, mages and I know that I want Crystal Maiden and Lich at tier one, and I want Storm Spirit, Earth Spirit, Kunkar, um, let's just say those. So we've got two tier ones and three tier twos um, that we know we want. Then when we're rolling at levels four, five, even six, and definitely three, I've got really pretty good value uh, because I'm gonna, I've got five pieces that I'm looking to hit um, and I've got reasonably good odds of hitting all of them. But once I have already found my Crystal Maiden three star and my Lich three star, and I'm sitting at level four, Suddenly, I'm, I'm not getting good value anymore because all of that extra percentage chance that I have to find tier one heroes is completely wasted. I don't need tier one heroes anymore. And so it's very important then to immediately start leveling up, um, not only to increase my power on the board, put more heroes in, maybe get some more alliances and stuff like that, but to make sure that my role value 
is on point. So I want to then move up to level five, probably six, because after that, I want to hit my Storm Spirit and my Earth Spirit, but hitting the tier ones is no longer useful to me, but maybe hitting Puck at tier three is really, really useful. So I would like to get to five, maybe six, be able to put a couple of spirits on board, increase my power level, maybe slot Kunkar in for the human bonus, whatever it is. But the most important thing in a roll build is working out where do I need to be rolling in order to get that value on the roll down. And of course, you sometimes need to level up simply to preserve your health total. Of course, your gold is uh, a resource, but so is your health total. And you are going to be spending that resource in a roll build. You will have a period of the game where you are weaker than your level build opponents because they will be leveling up faster than you and they will be putting more and more heroes on the board you will be putting more and more heroes on your bench while you build them up into three star pieces and until that happens essentially you will have less strength than your opponents on the board and you'll have less heroes on the board so your uh, health total will take a hit that's normal that's okay and you actually probably want to be losing uh, rounds in order to get the free rerolls that you get whenever you lose so one of the ways that roll builds differentiates itself from a level build is that instead of win streaking you very often want to be loss streaking making sure that you don't win any rounds at all you want to lose by as little as possible to preserve health total but you want to make sure that you lose that's not always the case in brawnies for example that's not the case in knights it's much less the case but in assassins and mages for example losing repeatedly can be a very good way to get those extra free rolls and you can get some kind of economy going while finding the pieces that you need to get the three stars all right, so now that we know what level we want to be rolling down on in order to find the heroes that we need, now we need to figure out how can we improve our chances? How can we manipulate the shop? How can we take advantage of what we know about the shop in order to get the best chances possible to hit our three stars? So we've already covered that the main and most basic technique is making sure that we're rolling down on the correct level. But after that, we want to learn three other techniques, which are blacklisting, overflowing and scouting so let's take each one of those and discuss them in turn scouting is looking at what your opponents are doing dota and lords works on a communal and finite pool of heroes and that pool of heroes contains a certain number of each tier one and a lesser number of tier two and a lesser number of tier three and so on heroes from which the shop offers five to each player, so offers all eight players five from that pool each round. And each of those heroes that are taken out of the pool reduce the chances of other players finding them. Therefore, it is important to use what is uh, by default the tab key to have a look at what your opponents are doing. Have a look at what build they are going for people do change a little bit but after the first 10 rounds it's generally quite set what people are doing and in the early game it's usually possible to predict and you will get better at this but you can predict what they're going for by having a look at their bench often don't forget the bench don't only look at the board some people have some strong stuff on the board to begin with but they're benching a different strategy and they're getting ready to change once they hit enough pieces so don't forget to have a look at the bench as well as the board if you can't see the bench don't forget you can scroll over and uh, and then see all of the bench pieces um, on the tab scoreboard so it's important to have a look at what they're doing and the reason is that if for example you're looking at going for roll knights roll knights are quite specific in roll builds in that they are very very bad when contested that's the second time i've used that word so i will explain it contested means that somebody else is going for the same build as you so if you are going for knights and they are going for knights we call this contested knights because the pool is communal and finite. So if they are collecting knights and you are collecting knights, then knights are being taken out of that pool that you cannot find. And so your chances of hitting the pieces that you want is going down and down. The more of them that they take out of the pool, the less chance you have of finding them. 
That's especially important if you're going for three stars. If you're both going for two stars, it's not that important. You can try to find three each from a pool of many and it should be okay. But when you need to find nine each, that changes the maths quite a bit. You can see on screen the number of heroes available at each tier in the communal pool. And so you can get an idea quite quickly of how easy or difficult it would be for two players while contested to hit three stars. At tier one, it is more possible. You have a pool of 30, and so finding 18 of them between two players is okay. If there's a third player involved, then it becomes a lot less okay. And even the word okay isn't great with a role build. You don't want okay, you want good. <laughs> uh, okay means that there's an okay chance that you'll die as well, because you'll miss. In tier five, of course, it's physically impossible. So there are only 10 of each in the pool. And so if one of them has, uh, if one player has nine Medusas, now that never happens, but let's imagine for a moment that someone has a three-star Medusa, it means that unless they suddenly have, I don't know, uh, a mental breakdown and sell their three-star Medusa, then it will be physically impossible for you to buy more than one Medusa in the entire game unless they are knocked out. So if they're knocked out or they sell the Medusa, then those Medusas will never go back in the pool and you will not be able to find them. So know what your opponents are going for. It's the key. Scouting is very, very important. At higher ranks, you can also use the fact that your opponents are scouting to try to bend things to your advantage a little bit. One technique that can be used, again, really only at the higher ranks, I mean Lord and above, and even then it sometimes doesn't work, is pushing people off a build. Which means the two of you are in the early rounds, you're both collecting, let's say, mages. So you're both collecting a few mages, you've got some Crystal Maidens, some Lich, maybe one of you's got a Storm Spirit. But you've also got, you know, you've maybe collected some assassins as well, and they've collected some hunter heart. Forgive me, some hunter heartless. And so, it's that situation where you're both hoping to find mages, but you're having a look at what your opponent's doing. You're going, oh yeah, that guy might be going mages. Okay, I'm going to keep these assassins um, just in case, because if he hits the mages harder than I do, then I can sell my mages and go into my assassins. As the player with the mages and the hunter heartless, one thing you can do is really commit and try to push the other player off. And by doing that, what you do is you sell all of your hunter heartless. You just sell everything which isn't a mage or part of a mage build. And by that, you're basically committing to that build. You're saying, I'm going mages. And so you're saying to the other player, right, my decision has been made. I'm going mages. And if I'm contested, if you come in and contest me, well, so be it. I'm definitely going mages. Whereas you have the choice. You can continue to go for your assassins that you have on your bench, or you can knowingly enter into a contested build with me. It is, of course, a very high-risk maneuver. One, your opponent might not be paying attention and simply do it without knowing. Two, they might be a stubborn person who goes, oh, screw you, I don't care if it's uh, if you've committed, I've got more mages than you, or I don't like being pushed around, so I'm going to go mages now, definitely. Or they might just hit the mages harder than you. So if their next shop contains four mages, there's no way you're going to push them off, and that's pure luck. Nothing you can do about that. So um, committing and trying to push people off only really works at the higher levels, and even then it's not 100% uh, reliable, but it's a technique to be aware of. The other thing you can do if you see that you're contested, um, or you have the potential to be contested, is to do the exact opposite, which is to bail out and say, right, I don't want to get involved in this dogfight. I particularly advise that you do this if you're looking at knights. Knights are incredibly bad when contested. And so if you see two people going for knights, don't take the risk for someone else to ruin your game. Simply go for whatever other build you have available. Um, bail out and jump on another build unless you hit really hard and even then if they still go for it if a, if, a, if a weaker player or an inexperienced player or a player that isn't scouting jumps in on knights with you it's going to be terrible so um you know those games happen they're unfortunate but yeah you always have the option that you can choose to bail out of that contest and go for a different build have a look down the list see what everyone's going for see what's uncontested see what you've got in your bench in your shop and make use of it 
Next up is blacklisting. Now this is probably the most important mechanic, which is not explained anywhere in the game, <laughs> which is absolutely insane. You'll see what I mean uh, as we go through it. So blacklisting is a sort of inbuilt, slightly hidden mechanic in the game, whereby whenever you manually roll, and please note there's a very important distinction between manually rolling and the automatic re-roll which happens at the start of each round. But each time you manually re-roll, each one of those heroes, as in all copies, every single copy of that hero, will not appear in the next shop. So you have effectively blacklisted that hero. You've told the game... I'm rolling past this hero, therefore I definitely don't want to see it on my next roll. It could come back the following roll, but for one roll, you will not see uh, that hero. And that means that if you re-roll a full shop and there are five heroes showing, then you will, and they are different heroes, then you will have removed every single copy of every single one of those heroes from the communal pool that could effectively appear in your next shop. That theoretically can be a very large percentage difference in terms of hitting the pieces that you want because if you remove such a large number of cards that you don't want, then you've got a much higher chance of hitting the ones that you do want. It's also important to know that the shop first selects randomly based on the level that you're at, what number of which costs will be presented to you. So for example, when you're sitting at level four and you're pretty much only gonna be shown level one and two uh, heroes, you might, get the odd three then it's going to say right okay new shops coming automatic re-roll here we go and here are this player's chances of finding tier ones so we'll give them that sort of random chance of number of tier ones and then random chance of number of tier twos and so their shop is going to look like this it's going to be uh for this shop randomly it's going to be four tier ones and one tier two Right, then it goes and takes all of the heroes which are not on another player's or your board or bench. So anything that is on your board or your bench can't be offered in the shop because it's a finite communal pool. Same for anything that's on any other player's bench or board. So all of the things that are on benches and boards, they're taken out of the pool. Then anything which was blacklisted. So after it's selected what tiers will be shown to you, all of the things that were blacklisted are taken out. And then randomly heroes from that tier are shown and uh, offered to you. Therefore, it is most powerful to blacklist heroes of the same cost as the heroes that you're looking for. This is the core of blacklisting. You find a shop which matches the costs of the heroes that you're looking for, has as many different heroes in it as possible. If you have, for example, two Lycans, you will only blacklist Lycan. You won't get any additional benefit. So in actual fact, you sort of have one less hero that could have been blacklisted. So seeing multiple of the same hero in a shop is not a good blacklist. We'll go through some examples of what really are good blacklists and what are not. But you are looking to find shops of the same cost as the heroes that you're looking for. So for example, let's say that you are in the later stages of a knight's build and you are looking to find Omni Knight, Abaddon and Spectre. All three cost pieces. And you see a shop with five different three cost pieces which are not like an Omni or Spectre. Then you have the perfect blacklist. So let's imagine that you are playing knights and you're moving into the later stages of the game. You're looking for Omni Knight, Abaddon, and Spectre, for example. And in your shop, you get quite lucky and you hit five three-cost pieces which are not the three that I just mentioned. Right. We know that at tier three, there are, I think it's 13 unique heroes. 
And of those, there are 18 copies in each pool. So by manually re-rolling, not automatically re-rolling, note that blacklisting does not occur if you allow the shop to roll automatically. You need to manually re-roll. It doesn't matter whether you pay or whether it's a free re-roll from a loss, but either way, you need to manually re-roll. Then each of those five heroes will be blacklisted from the next shop. And so you get 90 copies of tier three, assuming that you get this perfect blacklist where nobody has any of those heroes, where all five are different and where they're all three cost. It's a very unusual scenario, but in the perfect situation, 90 copies of cards have just gone out of the pool and there are 234 possibilities in total. So you've just improved your odds by, and I'm gonna check my notes, 38%. So 38% of the misses that you could have hit are now gone from the pool. 38%, right? This is not a small thing. This mechanic is huge and it has a massive impact on the success or failure of your role builds. You need to be looking at the shop in terms of blacklisting when you are rolling. And that sometimes means that you should stop rolling. If your health pool can take it, if your economy can take it, you should roll only when the blacklisting is good. Let's say that you are rolling down for tier one and tier two heroes and you see a shop with three tier ones and two tier twos. Great. Perfect blacklist. Roll. Then you see one with four tier twos and one tier one. Well, it's still decent. You want both, so you roll. And then you see one with two tier threes, two tier twos, and a tier one. But you're mainly looking to finish off your tier one so that you can level up. So there's only one tier one in the shop. That's a bad blacklist. That is not going to remove the cards that you want from the pool. It's not going to increase your chances enough. And so if you're able, if you're able to be patient, if your health pool will allow it, you wait, let the shop automatically roll, overflow those heroes, we'll talk about overflowing, overflow those heroes, and then on the next shop, hopefully you'll have a better blacklist opportunity with a bunch of tier ones and tier twos again, and then you can roll and roll and roll until you hit another bad blacklist shop, and you can decide, right, again, is my health pool able to sustain, you know, can I take another loss here, am I going to take another loss here, and um, is it worth the wait, do I, you know, is it more efficient for me to get the best possible blacklists, or do I need the tempo and momentum, do I need to push now and spend more gold to find my uh, three stars. So I hope that helps you to understand how blacklisting works. Of course, anytime you have any questions on this, do come by the stream. The link is in the description below and I am happy to answer questions and talk on Lords all day long. And I stream every Sunday through Thursday from five till 10 uh, European time. So do come in and join me there. The last technique that we're going to talk about today is overflowing. This is a question that I get a hell of a lot on stream and so I thought I would cover it in this guide as well. Overflowing is a lot less effective than blacklisting but works on a very similar principle and um, so let's talk about that now. Overflowing is the technique of taking heroes that you don't want out of the shop at the end of a round and then selling them back the next round after the new shop has rolled. The reason for that is that you are not blacklisting them. Obviously, if it's a really good blacklist, I recommend that if you're able, you blacklist. But if it's not a good blacklist, or you can't afford to blacklist, you know, it would, it would mess up with your interest gold, or uh, there's any other reason why you shouldn't be rolling at that stage, fine. But what you can do is take those heroes that you don't want out of the pool. Now, you won't take all copies of the hero. You will only take that one copy. But you're taking, let's say it's a, a full shop of stuff that you don't want, you don't need. You can take all of those heroes out of the pool by putting them on your board or your bench. If you remember earlier, we talked about the pool of heroes being both finite and communal well that means that any hero which is on a board or a bench does not get offered in anybody's shop and that includes your own so 
you can take those copies of those heroes out of the shop, put them onto your board or your bench if you have space, and then once the shop has rolled again, you can um, either sell them back to make space or you can keep rolling and keep those heroes out of the shop. And then at the end of your turn, whenever you're finished, you know, you're done with your shopping or you need the interest, you need the gold to hit an interest point, you just sell them all back. You don't need them. So it's only for one round. You just take them out of the pool, wait for the shop to roll and then put them back in the pool by selling them back. If that's the best thing for you to do, it usually is. So you sell them back and get your gold back to your interest uh, points, which are very important in the game. In level builds, in roll builds, interest gold, always very important. You want to be very careful about when and if you go below uh, 30 gold. The downsides of both blacklisting and overflowing are the mental capacity and the actions per minute that it requires to do so. Actions per minute more applies to overflowing. But if you think about it, Underlords, when played properly, is quite an intensive game. You need to be scouting, so looking at all of the other boards and seeing what everybody else is doing on their board and on their bench and calculating that data, taking it in and making sure that you're not just looking at it, but really thinking about it and thinking how it affects what you're going to do. So, oh, that guy's going for brawny and he's collecting puck. So therefore my mage build probably shouldn't focus around puck. Right. Okay, good. Note it. But that means that your scouting is quite active. On top of that, you're planning ahead what you're going to do. You're also thinking about your positioning. You're thinking about your items and where they're going to be on your heroes. You may be having a look at opponents' boards and thinking, okay, where are those barricades hunter compositions uh, positioned? Because I want to be on one side or the other. So maybe I need to move my positioning because of that. What are the pieces that I need to go for next? Oh, I'm contested. I need to change my direction and go for something else. What's the best way to transition? Can you see how much there is going on? And that's more important. I think everything I just talked about is more important than overflowing. Overflowing gives you a very, very minute advantage and chance to hit the things that you want. Overflowing is by far the least important of all the skills we've talked about today. And so... It is for when you are already comfortable with the game. I reached uh, top 100 rank with almost never using overflowing whatsoever. I was using blacklisting, but I was not using overflowing because I didn't have the actions per minute to do it. And I didn't have the mental capacity to be worrying about that as well as everything else that I was trying to focus on to up my game. So I highly recommend that you focus on all of the other aspects first. But if you are a micro intensive player, if you have the mental capacity and the actions per minute to pull it off, then absolutely do it. You can do it pretty much by muscle memory after a while. And you simply do it all the time. And you're getting that very small um, percentage chance increase of finding the pieces that you want. And over hundreds, thousands of games and rounds, you will see the benefit. So overflowing, the last technique that we'll talk about today. I mentioned uh, health total a little bit earlier on, and I'd just like to come back to that uh, before we finish. So again, as I said, you will be losing health in the, uh, in the period of the game where you have hit your two stars, but your opponent has hit theirs and is then leveling up and adding more heroes to the board. So there will be that lull in the middle of the game um, or the early mid game whereby you are actually weaker than your uh, opponents. But then there will be this power spike where you hit your three stars and stabilize essentially you start winning rounds again your health pool stops dropping and you're able to sort of get some breathing room uh, to maybe recover your economy because usually your economy uh, suffers a little bit at that stage where you hit your three stars because you have to roll down a lot spend a lot of gold and uh, hit your three stars and then your economy is a bit low you're not getting all your interest gold but suddenly you start winning rounds great you've got that power spike you're in this period of the game where the three star builds are more powerful than the uh, level builds it won't last forever. Once they reach level 10 and they start rolling down and hitting tier fours and tier fives and even two starring some of those, you will notice that the power sort of goes back in their direction. So we do need to take advantage of that period. 
Usually, the best way to take advantage of that period is to simply level up to your next roll stage. So you will be hitting the three stars that you need and then hitting the three stars that you want to finish off your build, whatever that might be. So have an idea in advance. Again, check my guides out if and when they are released and then you can have a look and see, right, okay, I'm playing brawnies. So my next stage, my sort of late game is to hit the Beastmaster three star and put a really good item on him um, and then maybe get some nice nice brute or something like that uh, to finish off the build so we'll grab i don't know life stealer with a mask of madness i don't know it doesn't matter but you need to know what your next piece will be and level appropriately it goes back again to leveling up to the right level to find the pieces that you want generally if you've hit all your three stars then trying to transition into a level build doesn't always work very well you often want to commit to a role build style uh, mages can pull it off not many of the other builds really can so don't necessarily uh, think okay i've hit my three stars so now i can go to level 10 and just put all the alliances in and do now nah, it's better to stick to your game plan hit certain levels roll down effectively blacklist overflow and scout effectively and make sure that you're not contested and then hit those pieces and continue to take really good advantage of the items that you have um yeah so we talked about uh gold we've talked a little bit about loss streaking but don't forget that when you're loss streaking for the love of god don't loot uh, don't win around <laughs> If you actually have a lost streak going and you think you're going, you're not going to be at a stage where you're going to turn it around anytime soon, make sure that you don't randomly win around in the middle. Even if you have to put take items off the board, make yourself purposefully weaker, uh, make sure that you keep that lost streak going because fairly quickly you'll be getting two gold per turn um, per round for the lost streak. And that's really, really impactful when your economy is a bit low. So don't uh, don't break your lost streak if you've got one going unless you are confident that you will be able to turn it into a win streak. The moment that you hit enough two stars, let's say that you're losing, 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 you're just trying to get your pieces together and then you um, suddenly hit three two stars. Well, that's a really good indicator that you're about to go on a win streak. If you hit enough two stars, fantastic slam them all on put the items in the ideal uh, slot put your positioning in a good place and suddenly you'll find yourself winning great that's a great time to transition from a lost streak to a win streak that is a transition if you just randomly win around it's like oh no because now you need to put effort into trying to win lots more rounds at that point you really want to try and get a win streak going whatever you're doing try to be streaking and i don't mean running about naked i mean either win streaking or loss streaking doesn't matter which one uh, both of them can be effective but make sure they're appropriate to your build so loss streaking better for roll builds win streaking better for level builds both can work fine the last resource that i want to talk today and we haven't discussed yet is bench space so bench space isn't really a problem that you encounter too much with level builds because you, all of your gold is going into leveling up, all of your excess gold anyway, and so you generally aren't holding on to many copies of anything because you're not trying to three star anything. So the most you'll have of any one piece is two, and so you can hold quite a lot of pieces on your bench that you're trying to two star, and then once you've two starred them, they usually, you know, you're leveling up fast enough where you can then just put them on your board. So bench space, not a huge problem. In roll builds, this is not at all the case. So with roll builds, bench space will be the bane of your life. And you need to realize just how much space you can take up trying to go for multiple three stars at once. So let's use uh, mages as an example, Crystal Maiden and um, Lich. And let's say you're going for Storm Spirit as well, because he's a very powerful mage. So you've got three mages that you're trying to three star at once. And so you've got those three on the board, let's say. So you've got three one stars on the board and then you two star them, wonderful. So you've got three two stars on the board, but now you want to get those three stars and you start rolling down. And so you've now got um, on your bench, uh, two Lich, two uh, Storm Spirit and two Crystal Maiden. So that's six out of your uh, eight slots gone. And now let's say you've got a couple of Earth Spirits that you're holding onto your bench is full, okay? Next roll, you hit a Lich. Fantastic, because that one will two-star on your bench. That's fine. You've now not only got a little bit closer to your Lich three-star, but you've also opened up another bench slot. Fantastic. Now you find another Lich. Okay, well, good. You're now closer to your three-star, but now your bench is full. And let's say you hit another Lich. 
Well, now you've got a problem because you need to make bench space in order to take advantage of that or you need to um, sort of wait till the end of the round and then put it on your board and then roll again hoping to hit some more two stars you need to basically two star some more things in order to make more space on your bench but as you are doing this and it all gets a bit time sensitive and you oh my god i need to get this and i'm rolling and i, I just need to find another two star and you know you have to hit one because otherwise you've got now you've been collecting this stuff on your bench uh, and on your board in order to then you know three star it and, and da, 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 da. you can already hear how much of a mess this becomes and in the worst case this can happen If you uh, accidentally or just run out of time and leave uh, pieces on your board and your bench is full, the game will, not randomly, but will delete uh, pieces from the board. And it doesn't necessarily, won't necessarily be the pieces that you would like to delete. As you saw in that clip, uh, the pain that you will suffer will be a long serving lesson uh, that you will not forget. So make sure that you... It is, however, necessary to do sometimes because, as I said, bench space is a problem and sometimes the only way to get enough bench space and to be able to take advantage of the number of tier threes that you have the potential to find is to roll down hard. Rolling down hard means spending all or most of your 30 gold or more. So it's saying, right, I've now got seven out of nine Lich and I've got six out of nine crystal maiden and seven out of nine earth spirit which means that I've, I've now got more than i can hold on my bench i don't want to level up and put it on my board and i need to clear some bench space so it means i need to hit a tier three now so i'm gonna just re-roll 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 grab stuff and i'm gonna uh, my bench is full so i have to, anything that i want to buy i have to put it onto my board and that means that if i'm not fast enough if i don't clear some bench space all of that gold will be wasted those pieces will be deleted or even worse better pieces from your board will be randomly deleted not good but you know that you're just going to buy and buy and buy and put these things on your board and eventually you, you know that there's a very very good chance that rolling that much spending that much gold at that level if you're at the right level then you will hit the lich eventually or that's what you're banking on and then you hit that three star lich boom all of the copies of the lich from the bench are all put together onto your board usually um and you then have all those bench spaces free fantastic all those additional storm spirits and earth spirits that you've been collecting can go onto your bench my recommendation when doing this is to think about before you start touching the r key if this all goes wrong if if i end up with eight out of nine copies of lich and maiden and storm spirit and earth spirit and i've got all of those and I, they're all um, and i'm gonna get everything's gonna get deleted it's all gone horribly wrong and i run out of gold i can't re-roll anymore which one am i going to sell so decide in advance right lich is the least important to me i'd love to hit the three star lich but i'd much rather hit crystal maiden storm spirit and earth spirit fine um, so if this all goes horribly wrong and I'm running out of time and it's going five, four, three, and you're thinking, oh God, it's going to delete everything. You've already decided in your head and it's much easier to react under pressure if you already have a plan, which is, okay, it's going wrong. Delete all the liches, just sell them all, sell them all. And then I can get all of the value that I've got left back onto my bench. And I might even get some interest gold as well. Who knows? So um, decide, have a plan before you do that big roll down and um, decide what you're going to get rid of. It will save you some pain further down the road. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this and that you will have a lot of luck and fortune, which you will need uh, putting this into practice with your roll builds. Of course, do stay tuned for my Knight's Guide, Brawny Guide, Mages and Assassins, all of the, bra uh, the roll builds that I like to use coming in the near future. And happy rolling. Happy rolling.